What's up everybody, my name is Brad and today I've got another short story review for you guys and I'm going to be talking about the third story in Stephen King's newest collection, If It Bleeds, the title story, If It Bleeds. Uh, real quick, I did a read-along on this book with my friend uh, Leslie from the Nerdy Narrative, Una and Crypto from the Codex Cantina, and Kasha from Kasha and Bookland, and I'll put links to all their channels down in the description. Uh, so for this video, it will be full of spoilers, just like the first two videos were for Mr. Harrigan's phone and the life of Chuck. Uh, the third story here, the If It Bleeds story, uh, this story itself is full of spoilers for the Bill Hodges trilogy, which is the books Mr. Mercedes, Finders Keepers, and End of Watch, and also has spoilers for the book The Outsider. Uh, so if you are planning to read those books and haven't and don't want to be spoiled, I suggest you read those first before coming to this story and read them in that order. Read the Bill Hodges trilogy first and then The Outsider and then the If It Bleeds story in here. Um, the reason that it's full of spoilers is because this is a Holly Gibney story and she appeared in those other books as sort of a major character. And this is her first outing, sort of having the leading role in her own story. Uh, so real quick, I'll do sort of a real quick breakdown of the the story real quick and then get into my thoughts on stuff on it uh, this story takes place i think about a year after the events of the outsider and holly is now running the finders keepers business um, it's sort of a detective agency uh, they help they hunt down bell jumpers and find lost dogs and that kind of stuff uh, jerome and barbara who also appeared in the bill hodges trilogy they are characters in here as well and one day Holly is watching TV and there's breaking news and it comes on and it was an explosion at a school, an attack at a school. Uh, someone mailed them a package and the package had a bomb exploded and there were casualties, children and uh, children and teachers were killed. And she's watching the news report and there's a reporter on there, his name's Chet Ondonsky, she's watching it. And once it goes off, there was just something not quite right about him. She can't quite place her finger on it. Um, like a week or so later, um, she sort of realizes what was bothering her. Uh, there was something on Chet's face that wasn't there in some of the other footage. It uh, looks like a mole or a piece of hair or something like that. And she goes on down the rabbit hole and sort of starts to think that Chet might have been the actual bomber. Uh, he arrived on the scene very early compared to everybody else. Um, he had that weird spot on his face. Just something about him wasn't sitting right with her. And that sort of led her to believe that he might be the same type of creature that she encountered in the book, The Outsider. Um, after she had that encounter with the creature from The Outsider, she went to see a psychiatrist and told him her, her story about what she saw in the cave. And she told him that he could use it, you know, use it in seminars and whatnot. Uh, but if any other um, patient of a psychiatrist ever had the same or similar story she wanted to be notified and the reason for that was because in the book the outsider at the end when they do finally encounter this creature face to face um, it asked them if they have ever it asked them sort of why do they believe why did they think it was real and it asked them if they have encountered other creatures like it and it came off as more of a curiosity thing like this creature itself didn't know if it was the only thing like it or if there were others out there like itself. Uh, so come to find out there was another patient by the name of Dan Bell that had a similar story to Holly. They get in contact with each other and it turns out Dan Bell is a retired uh, police sketch artist. He doesn't ever forget a face and he's been tracking uh, what will be called the Chet Ondonsky creature for like 50 years. Um, and every time he comes up, he's always a news reporter. Um, and he's always at the scene of some you know, horrible disaster, airplane crash, school bombing, you know, whatever it is. But he always looks just a little bit different. Uh, just enough where if you didn't know what you were looking for, you would think it was a different person. So there's enough there specifically for Dan Bell, you know, in his you know facial, facial recognition mind that he can tell it's the same person. Um, he's also working with his son, who's like a voice analysis, and they're able to also do voice analysis and they can tell they all have like the same sort of lisp and the same cadence and speech and whatnot. So Dan Bell's been tracking this creature for 50 some odd years and he hasn't really done anything about it because it has never uh, been aggressive or caused any pain. It just feeds off of pain. 
until this school bombing when it seems like he was the one who caused it so he could feed off of it. So Holly sets out to try to stop him. Um, sort of wrap it up, she tries to bribe Chet Ondonsky with all this evidence, saying she knows who he truly is, and she'll out him in public. And she's basically trying to draw him in to, to try to kill him. And they have a final standoff at the Finders Keepers organization. I'll just sort of leave it at that. Uh, but in this book, and if anyone has the Kindle version of this, if you can look in the If It Bleeds story specifically and see what mentions the term psychic vampire, let me know down in the comments. I think that it did, but I can't remember for sure, and I didn't go looking for it. Uh, but anyway, this Chet Ondonsky creature, he is basically a psychic vampire. He's a shapeshifter, like the creature was from the outsider, but he's a little more, more advanced. He can do it quicker, and he's able to change into multiple people instead of just one at a time. Uh, but he's basically a psychic vampire that feeds off of pain and fear and suffering and he, that's sort of his life force how he is able to sustain himself and live is by feeding off of these emotions uh, from other people all right so now i'm going to go down the put on my tinfoil hat and go down the conspiracy theory rabbit hole um, i believe that the if it bleeds story is obviously connected to uh, the bill hodges trilogy and the book the outsider because holly gibney is in all of those stories and it has the same two creatures similar creatures in the outsider in this uh, but i'm going to take it a step further than that i think it is also tied into the book it and the dark tower universe as a whole so my theory is um, these two creatures they were shapeshifters and they were psychic vampires they fed off of uh, pain and fear and suffering and they are very similar to the creature it from the book it um, if you don't know, the It entity is actually a female. At the end of the book, It, 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 It laid eggs. And I believe the Losers Club destroyed all the eggs at the end. But that isn't to say that that creature hadn't laid eggs before. It's been here basically since the dawn of time. Uh, there's like a scene in the book where it crash lands on Earth and it's like all prehistoric and whatnot. Uh, so that isn't to say that it hasn't had uh, laid eggs before and had children before. And I think the creature in the If It Bleeds story and the creature from The Outsider are offspring of the entity known as It. They are all shapeshifters. They are all psychic vampires. They all feed off of fear and grief and sadness and suffering. Uh, there is another psychic vampire in another story that I won't mention. I don't want to give anything away. Um, I don't know if it's a shapeshifter, but it is a psychic vampire. It does feed off of emotions. This one feeds off like joy and laughter. It basically causes you to laugh yourself to death. Um, I believe that is also an offspring of the entity known as It. Um, and then, of course, It is tied into the grander, the Dark Tower universe itself. So I think, um, in the broad scope of things, I think It has laid eggs in the past and has had these offspring and these... Uh, this was one of the offspring, the one from the outsider was another one, and the other psychic vampire that feeds off of laughter and stuff, I believe that is another of its children, basically. Uh, so that's sort of my, my tenfold hat theory. Uh, one other thing real quick, um, it went as Robert or Bob Gray, um, and in, I haven't read the Tommyknockers books, but I know in the Tommyknockers, I think they're called the Greys, and then in... Uh, Dreamcatcher, I think there's another character that has the last name Gray that is one of the aliens. Uh, so I think they're all sort of uh, semi-related type of species. They all look sort of a little bit different. They all have uh, different abilities and whatnot, but they're all outsiders. I believe they're all sort of related to each other. Um, a lot of people thought that the psychic vampire that feeds off of laughter, they thought that that actually was Pennywise or It. And Stephen King actually came out and said, no, they're not one and the same, uh, but they are of the same species. They are sort of related. So I think that's where um, that thing is the offspring of the father of everything of it. Uh, so that's my conspiracy theory. Uh, real quick before we get done, uh, this story didn't have as deeper uh, meanings and themes and things as the first two stories. Uh, but I did have a little bit of social commentary, I think. And that is in the actual title of it, If It Bleeds, uh, the old adage, If It Bleeds, It Leads. 
uh, which is basically saying if it is something horrific or violent or whatnot, that always seems to get the most attention in the news media. And if you turn on the news, it's always talking about a natural disaster or a terrorist attack or you know, an explosion or a drunk driver, or someone was murdered, brutality, whatever it is. Uh, those always seems all those always seem to be the stories that get the most traction, get the most views, get the most likes, whatever it is. And then the feel-good stories, those always seem to be at the end of the news. They're like 30 seconds long, and by that point, no one's probably paying attention anymore. Uh, the thing where you drive down the street and there's a car wreck, and you, you're looking over trying to see the car wreck. I'm guilty of that myself. Um, it seems like our society, at least Americans, I don't want to speak for other societies, but at least Americans have a morbid fascination with other people's pain, other people's suffering, other people's grief. Now, there's whole industries based on it. Um, you know, the news and tabloids, you know, they're always talking about tabloids or some about celebrities getting divorced or one's beating up the other one or one had an abortion or whatnot. We just seem, we can't get enough. We <clears throat> ourselves seem like psychic vampires. We're feeding off of other people's pain and suffering and whatnot. And you'll see even something like a uh, video compilation on Facebook or Twitter where it's people falling down and getting hurt or you know, doing stupid things and getting hurt. Those get millions of views and people laugh at them. I myself, I've watched them and laugh at them. I'm feeding off of other people's pain and suffering and getting my own enjoyment out of it. I'm feeding off of that. And if you really break it down and think about it, that's sort of sickening that we do that as a society. And that we put that up on such a high pedestal, you know, other people's, you know, tragedies and stuff and watch those and, oh, that didn't happen to me, so that makes me feel better. I can either laugh at it because they fell down and got hurt or gossip about it saying, that wasn't me, that was someone else, it makes me feel better. Um, I think Stephen King was sort of touching on that a little bit in this story because uh, Holly tries not to be like that. Uh, she tries not to look at the car crash on the side of the road, tries not to watch the horrible stuff on the news and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's all I really have to say about it. Um, I guess one other thing real quick. Um, if you have never read the other books that have Holly Gimme in them, now you're not going to get a lot of character development uh, from her in this book because all that other character development has been done previously in the other books. Uh, when we first met Holly Gimme, she was a vastly different character than what she is in this book. She's grown a lot. Um, she's, like I said, she's grown up a lot. She's changed a lot. She's matured a lot. And she's already had all that character growth by the time we meet her here. So if you haven't read those, you might not feel as attached to Holly. Um, you can still go in and read it and won't be lost or anything. I know Leslie had not read the other books. And I don't know about Una and Crypto. I don't know if they have or not. Uh, but I still think they enjoyed the story to a certain degree. But I don't think they enjoyed it as much as I did because I had those previous attachments to Holly. Uh, well, that's all I have for you guys today. I've gone on and rambled long enough. Uh, this was the... My review for the story, If It Bleeds, from Stephen King's collection, If It Bleeds, I gave it four stars. I did really enjoy it, and I like the possible uh, tie-ins to the broader Stephen King universe. Uh, but that's all I have for you guys today, so thanks for spending your time with me. Again, my name is Brad, and I'll talk to you all later. Bye.